Hello. I think we'll get started here. Probably going no mic. The room seems to hold the noise pretty well. I'm David Graham Kemper, Troy Kirby's sidekick in this Osmos conference. Um, this is about sports employers and what they're looking for um, in candidates. And uh, I'd like the panel to introduce themselves and give your 30 second spiel on who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Joe Cody. I'm the Senior Vice President of Ticket Sales for the Portland Timbers and Thorns. Uh, Thorns is the NWSL team, Timbers and MLS. Uh, James Bryant, good by JV. I'm the Senior Manager of Sales Down for the Colorado Rapids. Stephanie Morrell, I'm the General Manager of the Bellingham Bells. We're a summer collegiate baseball team. Danny Tetzloff, Everett Aqua Sox Baseball Club up in Everett, Washington. We're the modeling team, one of the modeling teams for the Bears. I'm the GM. Jeff Yoakum, I'm the founder and president of Marquee Search. We're an executive search firm specializing in sports and live entertainment. Based down at five in Portland. Most of our clients are not in Portland, uh, but I come from the, the agency side where I serve mostly professional sports teams and helping them make the right hires. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. Um, what I'd like to talk about first and foremost are entry level type positions. Um, you know, it's a good mix of professional teams and minor league teams and recruiters as well. Um, so what kind of positions do you typically post and, 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 and fill for, uh, for entry level positions? And what kind of candidates are you looking for to fill those roles? What kind of experience, what kind of skills? Uh, for the Timbers and Thornby, it's generally account executives or uh, member service coordinators. Uh, account executives uh, sell our season ticket packages for Timber, the Timbers, Thorns, and Timbers 2. Uh, I to mention them there, our USL team. Uh, and member services uh, coordinators, uh, they work with our season tickets. We call them uh, annual members, memberships. Um, they work on uh, renewing them year over year and providing them service year over year. And how many positions do you typically fill in a given year, did you say? Uh, we've been pretty fortunate to have a lot of continuity. I would say two to three a year. Okay. Uh, for us at the Rapids, so we have our Colorado Rapids Sales Academy. We have 10 inside sales reps. Uh, uh, typically, these folks are um, either uh, they've just graduated from college uh, or maybe from a grad program uh, or in addition to maybe looking for a career change. But really, kind of our, it's about a six to eight month program uh, and really objective is to really teach uh, our candidates kind of sales and just using tickets as kind of a, a platform to kind of teach them to how to sell. And we believe that selling, and I'm sure everybody on the panel will agree, that selling or sales is a, is a great asset to have for really any role that you uh, that you aspire to be in. So um, our, our job is to, um, is to kind of hopefully have those people come through our program, kind of very sort of baseball S, like, you know, we're kind of like the AAA sort of team uh, of our sales, uh, sales squad, uh, and our goal is to make sure that these, these folks kind of go into more of the account executive and the premium and suite roles um, you know, within our club, or Cronky Sports and Entertainment, which is the, uh, the umbrella organization that we that we, sure, yeah. uh, we hire every year, a, I mean, a game day staff of about 50, and on that staff we have coordinator roles, which are part-time in the summer, but um, good opportunities to, to manage and kind of dive into different operations. Um, aspects in our club. Uh, front office wise, we're pretty small front office. We have three in our front office, and so um, we look for people who can generate revenue in some way. Everybody sells, um, me included, and so um, they always have a sales aspect, it's usually sales marketing or just sales. Uh, and as for when those come up, I mean, we've been pretty lucky. We've been on a streak now where everyone's been with us at least a year, but sometimes um, you know, you're looking every season or more often than that, but um, generally, if we're hiring in the front office, it has a sales component 100% of the time. Uh, similar to what's been said, sales is important when you're when you're small like we are. Everybody needs to have a sales aspect to their job, even if your job is uh, finance or finance director, and all you do is the books. You're still going to sell when you pick up the phone. You're selling the organization, so. You may not have direct sales um, responsibilities, but you're still selling. But our entry-level positions, 
uh, typically full-time are our ticket sales representatives uh, where you're selling group outings, season tickets, mini plans, uh, just group outings where people bring their company out for a, for a night at the ballpark. But we do have some uh, entry-level positions that are seasonal that we usually hire every summer. Uh, they range from ticket assistant to operations manager where you help maintain the ballpark and oversee the ushers. Uh, we have a media assistant which helps write game stories, helps develop the website. And then we also hire someone to help run our concessions which is kind of the dirty work of the operation. Nobody ever wants to do it because it's not real glamorous. Nobody thinks cooking hot dogs is any fun, but honestly, for, every, for a lot of teams, that's one of your biggest revenue generators in the ballpark. So if you come in and run a food and beverage operation at my level and decide that you want to do that as a career, you will be, your resume will go in a stack that's really little when you're applying for jobs. <laughs> when you're applying for the, for the Director of marketing with a lot of teams, the staff would be like this. Food and beverage is like this. So, just just a just an idea uh, uh, that I throw out there for you guys. So. Mostly, we place mid senior level stuff. So, not a lot of most organizations aren't going to ask a recruiter to help them fill the field. We'll get to moving up a little bit here. Um, so, where do you guys typically post your jobs when they're when they're available? Uh, and where do you, you know, do you go to career shows, do you go to, uh, just go online and post them on certain sites online? How do you typically find your entry level candidates? We post it on uh, Teamwork Online, uh, that's kind of the industry uh, go-to. Um, we started posting more on LinkedIn as well, uh, or at least posting the, the link from Teamwork on LinkedIn. It's, it hasn't worked out much better for us than the classic Teamwork in the past. Yep. We, we do the same. Uh, we actually kind of took a, a different approach probably about a year ago um, where we are now actually going on campuses and actually hosting um, kind of like a five hour workshop. Um, and really kind of the, the ultimate goal of it is to, is to help students find if, if, if sales, which I think for a lot of people might seem to be a little bit of a dirty word, um, you know, and uh, are afraid or don't want to do sales or ticket sales. Uh, but our goal on these these combines is to really show you guys kind of what we do with our two weeks of onboarding period, period at the Colorado Rapids. So we take candidates who go from picking up, you know, what is it like picking up a phone to how to how to close uh, an appointment or sale. And, and our goal is to help students see if this is actually a career that they want to be in. And I think that's kind of probably the, the thing that kind of keeps us up at night or something keeps me up at night about is this person wanting to do this particular role or not? Use that horrible phrase, foot in the door, um, that, that we all uh, um, that want to hear. Yeah, we, we post all the, to, you know, LinkedIn, um, we'll do Indeed.com, we'll do our own website, but, but really, um, you know, with an organization as small as ours, I need to make sure that every hire really counts and really works, and I want to know, I mean, it keeps me up at night if I'm hiring you, and I think that maybe, you know, not going to be a good fit in the sports organization or you don't really want to roll hot dogs on a busy day or whatever it is and so um, a lot of my best hires have been people I already knew. Um, I either met them in a room or they worked for us on our game day staff, known commodity of, of so the first thing I do when I've got a position is you know I've emailed Danny before because he's right down the corridor and he does the same to me. Hey who do you know who's out there who have you worked with before in any sort of capacity that's that's good that we can reach out to so um, working my network is you know after we put out those, those job uh, descriptions. Uh, teamwork online for us has been a go-to spot. We uh, also, minor league baseball has an organization called Professional Baseball Employment Opportunities, uh, pbeo.com, and they host the job fair at the baseball winter meetings, which is a county call, but it's where I got my first job in baseball. Went there with 500 other eager beaver, beavers, and, and I was the only one there that had uh, three at the front of their age. Everybody else was probably 21, 22. Um, so no, I did find one other guy, and we looked at each other and said, "What are you doing here?" But uh, it's it's a it's a great place to find a job in baseball, and there's there's a hundred teams that are looking for you know employees. It's another opportunity that. A lot of teams were hiring there, now they're getting 
smarter and they're hiring people more at this time of year instead of waiting until December to hire for key positions. But uh, in this industry, there's a lot of movement, so there's always spots we're trying to backfill. When we do post positions that are entry level, we'll put them on our website, monkeysearch.com. Uh, we'll use our Twitter feed and LinkedIn. Uh, and then we've started a little low brow, we've started using YouTube just to do a little bit of primer. Like a, you know, we're trying to stand out essentially. It's like, hey, if there's this new position, we want to make sure that it's getting some traction. So we'll make an introduction, like a one minute primer, and invite people to check out the link to this Vice President of Partnerships for the current client we're working on. So we're trying different ways, I guess, to, to get noticed kind of in that, in the social space, I guess. Excellent. So you bring in your new recruits and put them through their ringer. Uh, it's usually a fair amount of turnover in those entry level positions. What makes the candidate stick and actually move up into a full time position and then possibly into a management position? What, what are you looking for in that first year um, of employment uh, from those entry level sales reps? Um, for us, um, a couple things. One, um, the openness to being coached because we know we're not getting a finished product. So we know we're going to have to, you have to be open to being coached up and training and learning the ins and outs of ticket sales. It's, you know, yes, uh, uh, food and beverage isn't glamorous, but ticket sales isn't glamorous either. Uh, you don't get people looking like this in a glamorous job. So, um, so I mean, you know, you have to be open to, to learning the ins and outs of ticket sales. And then the other thing, it's for me, it's very simple. It's just, are you willing to be there and be enthusiastic um, and um, come in every day excited uh, to work? Because uh, as Jamie brought up earlier, the dreaded, I just get my foot in the door. Um, if that's your outlook on it, then you're not going to be enthusiastic about being there to sell tickets. You're just, I'm just going to do my two years and get through. So it's not going to, it's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do us any good either. Not to have someone there who's just going through the motions. So uh, being present and being. Uh, Enthusiastic about actually doing the job because uh, it's an important job. It's the normal revenue source and for us. It's the normal revenue source uh, and for most teams. That's the case. So uh, that's those are the things that we look for, and that's going to carry you through, carry on to, to moving into the next uh, next phase. We have uh, we have four pillars that we that we look for. First and foremost, effort being the first one. This is an industry that everybody is excited to be part of. So if you do not have the effort to come in day in day out. I kind of like to call it bring the juice, bring the energy. Uh, it's kind of our tagline, so having the effort. And number two, discipline. Discipline in your craft, and discipline in how you go about executing your uh, you know, your day to day. Uh, number three, I think is the number one trait that is underappreciated, is mental toughness. Um, this industry, we get a lot more no's than yeses. Um, it's about how you react to uh, getting those, the, those no's. Are you gonna come in the next day after picking up the phone a hundred times come and do it again and again and do it for days and weeks and, and, uh, and months on end. And then number four, entrepreneurship. Uh, understanding that this industry is not a nine to five, it is a lifestyle. Um, and you have to embrace uh, that go-getter attitude of being an entrepreneur uh, and kind of a go-getter. Um, so we look for those four kind of characteristics of effort, discipline, mental toughness, and entrepreneurship. For sure, yeah, I, I mean, I can echo those four things are absolutely what I would look for. The first one being effort, um, work ethic, the ability, I mean, just being driven. Um, this is not an industry where someone is, like, I'm not a micromanager. If you need micromanaging, I will not micromanage you. Like, I don't have time to do that, and no one in our industry does. And being able to be self, you know, a self-starter, to be able to be driven. And um, everybody wants to work in sports, but after the first season that you work in sports and you see the 100 hour weeks, you see the long days, you see the things that you miss up and you miss people's weddings and other things and you've got to love it, you've got to want, you've got to want it and you've got to have a passion for it and that's what I look because I know that'll get you through the hard days when you get a bunch of no's, like you'll want to come back tomorrow if, if you love it and you've got the passion for it and, and you're a really hard worker. Uh, the other thing I look is just for like the commitment to our organization as a whole. Like, yeah, it's about you and it's about developing you, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna teach you and, and all of that. But I want you to be passionate about our organization because you're out in our community, you're selling, you know, us and our products, and I want you to be excited to come over, to come to work every day, not just because you're working for sports, but because you align with our mission and you care about the things that that we care about. And so I look for a good fit with you know, our organization. 
they've covered about everything. But, uh, you know, the, the entry-level positions that we hire, like seasonally, a lot of people just do it because they say, hey, I'm required to get an internship. But that's where a lot of us look to hire. I mean, today, before I came down this morning, uh, guys started with us as a full-time year-round position who worked for us this past summer as, as our stadium ops guy. He was overseeing the ushers and the cleaning crew and, and our parking attendants and things like that. And he, uh, he did what we need. He showed good work ethic. He showed up on time. He's passionate. He did his job. And then when he saw this opening, he, he asked about it, applied for it. And we put him in with everyone else and he stood out. And we, we, he's a known commodity for us, so that helped us in hiring him. We knew. He doesn't know everything about ticket sales, but we can coach him up, like he said, and, and we know he'll he'll show up and work hard. So he proved himself. So any internships you got are a great opportunity. That's really a, a tryout for a full time job. So, yeah, so there's lots of competition, obviously. First you get your first job in sports and then on top of that it's probably even harder to move up. Um, so, you know, a lot of times you're gonna have to move. So from one team to another, sometimes a different market. I moved four times throughout my career to, uh, to get where I got to. Um, but I want Jeff to go into some more detail just about the recruiting side. So that's a whole other angle. Um, recruiters are hired by teams to go out and find quality, top-notch candidates for positions they're trying to fill. So Jeff, you want to touch on the recruiting side of the business and just what value you bring to teams and what you're looking for. Sure. I mean, I think recruiters are an extension of our, we're an extension of our organizations that we work with. So our approach is that we're bird dogging talent and we're hired to do things that our clients can't do. So we will execute a search for, let's say, vice president corporate partnerships. We will build a pipeline for our clients. We will be a nonfiction storyteller. They can go out there and uh, our clients don't need volume. They don't need to, uh, hey, we need a bunch of resumes. They need the right candidates, and the right candidates are usually so busy with their heads down, working hard, being successful, that they're either going to get referred to us or we're going to find them uh, in other ways. And we're specialized. Our niche is, is sports and entertainment, so we're niche wide and mile deep. We've been doing it for like almost 20 years. And so there's a lot of relationships built up over the years to try to find those kinds of people. So the value is you, as you build your career, you really want to perform at a high level. You want to be a good teammate. You want to basically believe that you will get noticed by performing at a high level. You're going to get noticed by your peer group, by someone else that's going to put you on the radar for a recruiter. Now, that doesn't always happen, so it's probably a good idea for you to build relationships with recruiters during the course of your career, not, hey, I need a job tomorrow, I'm going to call somebody and, and say, I need help from. Build those relationships. We're human, too. We know that when someone calls us and they just, you know, they never call us, never turn around, call, now they need something, and all of a sudden they're at your doorstep. We're human. So show depth and, and, and uh, nuance and contact and build relationships over the course of time. Ask your peers, ask people that you trust, who you, who you recommend. There's a handful of people that do what we do out there. Um, so if it's not us, it's somebody else that they recommend, someone's going to have an experience with those people. Try to get that kind of information. Uh, but I, I think you know, by, by putting your head down and working really hard, good things are going to happen. I would also recommend that you know how to articulate and, and storytell and message above you, like manage up, which managing up is, can you communicate your numbers? Can you, can you talk about your accomplishments? So if you're at a conference, if you're at an event, can you talk about your accomplishments? Because those, those thoughts that are distilled um, are really are, are potent kinds of things that you can tell someone that's in the pretty field. So they say, hey, tell me more yourself. You say, well, here's my some accomplishments that I've had in my last job. So, those are things that can at least prepare you for those kinds of phone calls in the future. But at the end of the day, don't get the wanderlust where everybody's probably seen someone in their staff where they've got wanderlust. They're, um, they're thinking about their next job. They're thinking about the job they don't have versus the job they have. And that is a recipe to be out of work looking for your next job. And that's a bad spot to be. You always want to be looking for your next job from the comfort of another job. Good point. And from the team side, do you guys use recruiters very often outside of the regular you know, team works and job boards? Yeah, we use, uh, we use Jeff just to fill a position in February, uh, director of recruiting seating. So, great. Yeah, we, 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 we don't currently, I think, for, uh, we see, you know, Jeff's expertise is more sort of the middle sort of management, so we do. Uh, 
a lot of inside sales managers um, across the sort of country are sort of you know, either going to conferences like these, um, you know, trying to schedule um, you know, meetings with professors and be able to do Skypes and go on campuses to really try and uh, um, get in front of uh, potential potential students. So for, for us, it's, uh, it's a little bit different, but uh, um, I will say one thing: uh, every single every single organization is recruiting. 365 days a year. There is not a single day we are not recruiting. So uh, keep that in mind. Whether the job is open or not, we are we're always trying to find those uh, uh, the, the best candidates. For, for, because you never know when someone moves on. You know, they, they come and say, "Hey, I'm leaving in two weeks for whatever reason. I've got a great opportunity to, to move elsewhere." It's okay. Do I have that pipeline um, ready to uh, fulfill this position? So we are recruiting every single day. Yeah, I 100% agree. We don't use recruiters um, just mostly because we're small and we are normally looking for entry level positions, but um, I'm always recruiting kind of people that I meet. I actually am in the job that I'm in because six years ago I was interfacing with this team from an account rep side and they started recruiting me and you know a year later I was on the other side of the table. So um, yeah, we're always looking and um, always having those ideas because you just never know what's going to happen with your young staff as they navigate to their careers. Excellent. Yeah. Similar to Stephanie, we don't uh, <clears throat> recruit for the, mainly our jobs are entry level, but I will, I do network, I reach out, I reached out to somebody, two different people over the weekend saying, hey, I've got this position open, and you know anybody, and I've already got a couple leads back from that, and it's people I trust. So whether you get to know the recruiter, as you get further along in your career, or as you're First starting career, make sure you network, get to know as many people. Like Jeff said, put your nose down, work hard. People do notice. A lot of times, people don't think they get noticed, but that's most most everybody sitting here notices the people that work. It's the people that work hard, try to look busy, are the ones we also notice too. But they don't last long. And I would say too, the sports world is like really small too. So the experiences that you do get, you know, when you get the internships when you're. You know, whether it's food and beverage or whatever, you know, work hard, don't burn your bridges, do a great job. Because if someone crosses my desk and it's anywhere in the Pacific Northwest and I know the person, you know, even a little bit, I want to pick up the phone and say, hey, how was your experience with so-and-so? Did they work hard? Did they do, you know, and you may not have listed that person on the, on the reference, but I'm going to ask. And it happens all the time. So just make sure you're covering your bases. That, that goes a long way. Very good. Let's see a show of hands. How many of you are looking for your first job in sports? Close the room. And how many are currently working on a team with a team or maybe sports? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Do you guys have any questions for the panel or for me? Now's your chance. These are four hiring managers right here in front of you. Five, really. Uh, I guess for the, the crew in the room, for someone that uh, someone that has a lot of sales experience, what would uh, I guess what do you kind of look for for people that are maybe trying to look for that opportunity management without sports experience, but with a lot of the grind, a lot of the sales experience? You know, have you seen a lot of that transition, or is it a lot of going, grind again, and almost restart? I'd say that I mean, one sales is, is a really good way to pivot into the industry. There should be some transferable skills. We talked a little bit earlier about the digital component, which there is some transferability towards sports for sure. Um, I would suggest that if you're moving into the industry from another industry, you're probably going to have to make some sacrifices and fight the bullet a bit on probably compensation. Uh, probably not making a lateral move into the industry. You're probably going to have to take a step back in some way, shape, or form to prove yourself. And so there's those gut check moments that people say, is it worth it? Should I do it? And we don't know what your quality, the status of your life is. You know, when I went out and started a business, it was a good time in my life to actually do it. Um, so there are times when you can take risks and time when you can't. But if you're just unhappy and you're like, I really want to do this, get enough information and then go take no for an answer. So uh, but if, if it is transferable skills, that should serve you well. But you probably will have to, you know, whether it's title deflation, whether it's comp, um, those are some challenges. The ability to relocate, the ability to go somewhere else. Again, those are things that are going to uproot your life, and it gets harder the older you get. So if you're young and you have the capacity to relocate, do it now. This is a great thing we'll put this day. It's a cheaper commerce day out here. But if you're going to move from where you are now, this is you can go to markets that aren't the most attractive top markets, but you can get amazing experience. 
kind of get to where you are. Joe didn't start where he was. You know, he served time. He did serve time in the <laughs> uh, three, three months of hard labor. I, I learned about this guy from, from his former boss, uh, by the way. So, so referrals are great. I learned about him from his former boss 10, 15 years ago, who still loves him. Every time I talk to him, he's like, how's Joe Cody? Uh, but that, that stuff happens in this industry. And yeah, Jeff, he, play, Jeff plays me in my job now. Okay, so. and, he had, and he had served time in Columbus and, and PD, South Carolina. Yeah, that was four months there. And Hartford, yeah. you know, and so I mean, those are the stories. Everybody that you look at in this industry has a story. And it's, I think LinkedIn's a great tool to reverse engineer people's careers. How did you get to where you went? Well, if, I'm, if I don't know you, I can look at your LinkedIn profile and say, wow, you didn't start in sports, apparently. You know, then this is the track that you took. Uh, that means that the job that you really want is not this linear path probably to there. It probably, it's probably circuitous. And it's not always the step up, it's this jungle gym. You know, it's not this ladder that you climb, you're climbing a jungle gym. And sometimes you're stepping back or you're stepping sideways to get up because you're blocked. But that is part of the allure and the beauty of this industry too. If you really want it bad enough, it's there for you. Yeah, I, I'd probably add, we've had, um, very rarely do we hire people who have sales experience and to not do our inside sales program. Uh, it's not necessarily because we don't think that they, that they haven't sort of carried a, a great skill set from the previous job. Um, the last two people we've actually hired, one came from medical sales uh, and another one came from a political campaign background. Uh, so completely, completely different. But I've got a dirty word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's you know the reason why we've why we set it up the way we have in, in Colorado is because you know our, our goal was to literally train uh, our folks in sort of the, the art of professional sports you know um, and, and there are certain sort of nuances you know we're really focused on B two B selling face to face selling use using sort of social platforms like one more that uh, I don't know if you guys are not familiar with you know we we are we're training you guys to uh, be in professional sports environment. So um, we, we look at it from strictly a training and development platform. And we don't want anybody to necessarily not get that training. That is ultimately going to lead them to not just get to the account executive level, um, but it's like, how do I get to the premium and how do I get to the management? And I think, uh, especially in the sales, in the, in the ticket sales world, one of the really comforting things is that everybody has probably done inside sales at some point in their career. And there's something, you know, my guys know when I was in inside sales, like I, I, I cut my teeth at that point in my life. So there's that kind of connection that you have with that direct report, knowing that they have actually done it themselves. Um, I think that kind of brings to um, a really strong point when you try to create a great culture. People have done what you're, what, what these entry level roles are doing. And I think we were able to kind of relate to that, um, the, the, that piece. Any more questions? Yes. How much do you value having like a master's degree, an MBA, or a SIM degree when you're looking at your, your candidates to hire? Um, uh, okay. I, 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 I don't have one myself, so I, I do find it very admirable that people have gone on to that. Um, it's not something necessary. Um, I don't. <laughs> I take that honest, honestly. I take it with a grain of salt. I really do. It's yeah. It's great that you have that, but I, you don't need to go learn. You don't need a master's degree to learn how to sell. You know, I mean, you don't. Uh, code. I don't have one. I, I do it. Do it in 19 years. So uh, it's pretty clear. But um, so it's it's not necessary. It's a nice sure. It's a nice thing. Um, it'll probably serve you better in your next role if you move if you move on. You know, if you move up. Um, but I, I'm someone who just thinks the real world experience is, is powerful, uh, just as powerful, even more so than getting a master's degree. So, sorry for any colleagues out there. Anyone that has a master's, my fault. I think you're right about it paying off later in the career. I mean, that's, that's it's the long game. If you're going to get a master's, don't get a master's. I think it's going to help you get your first job in sports. Now, I mean, if it's a financial analyst, or I mean, you you might look at some 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 sectors of the industry that a master's degree is going to help you when you start thinking about the you know, analysis in, in certain areas. So there's probably some things that you could do that will elevate you. But generally, it's more, you're talking five years down the road, when it's they're choosing managers or choosing directors or VPs. 
they're saying, wow, well, all things equal, we're going to take the whole person with a master's degree, someone who has more strategic thinking. Because what are you getting a master's degree for? You know, is it, it, just because you wanted one, because it, like, you, know, you grew up wanting one, or your, your family were administrators, you know, I think you have to kind of look at it and say, what, what's the reasoning? Um, and understand that a master's could open more doors to you because of the program that they have that is esteemed and they've opened, you know, they've got this, they've populated the industry with a bunch of people from those programs. That can help you. But generally, uh, get your start, start the meter. I think I can see Joe, start the meter on your career to get the experience and then determine, do I need to leave to my master's? You can do, there, there are now good online programs. You know, check them out. There, there are programs you can do remotely from a distance that can help you get the leg up for the next job to kind of elevate you from the position that you're in now. But you've got to start the meter in your career first. I do think having been in college athletics for 10 years, that on that side of the business, the master's is probably a little bit more, uh, you know, better on that side. Um, I've applied for some jobs throughout college athletics, and um, I won't even get looked at because I don't have a master's. So on that side of the business, I do think it makes a difference, especially as you move up into associate AD plus positions. And the master's degrees now are becoming more specialized. So, uh, you know, I went to South Carolina. So, so. Okay. okay. Uh, but South Carolina is, is all about uh, uh, building. It's all about uh, arena, arena management. So if you don't want to be in arena management, don't go to South Carolina, get a master's degree. I mean, it's not going to help you out. But if you could, if you are in your career already and you know where you, which way you want to go, you can find a master's degree that's going to work best for you. Because if you're in there, you go, you know what, I do like arena management. Right. Go be a game cop. That's a good thing. Um, but so I think that going later is probably more beneficial than right at, right after. Because if, if you were if you were at South Carolina, you just went and you just got a master's, then you get out and you're like, I don't even like working in arenas. You just wasted two years and a bunch of money. So I mean, it gives you better options. You can expect more money. I mean, I, I'm sorry to go on this point. One, one more thing is that I think if you have a master's and you're in industry, normal industry, not sports, I think there's an expectation that you're going to get a little more money because you got that master's degree. That's not going to happen in sports. They're not going to say we're going to elevate the comp plan because you have a master's degree. You just and, <coughs> More questions? Yeah, I got Lance Robert. I talked to a few guys earlier. Um, one thing I guess I noticed you guys saying is telling a story when you came to run your resume. And that's something I've always struggled with as far as finding employment anywhere. I'm usually good at like listing my strengths and weaknesses and my accomplishments, but I have a hard time kind of making it unique to me. I don't know if you guys have any tips or recommendations how to kind of make a personalized resume or in person to kind of tell a story uniquely that kind of stands out to you? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the things I notice the most is not just the resume, but when you get in front of someone and you're interviewing is um, people lack the ability to sell themselves, you know, and, and so often I'll be 50 minutes into an interview and someone will say something like, oh yeah, you know, I used to do this with my college newspaper or something, and it's like, yes, that's it, like this is applicable experience and you just waited 50 minutes to tell me about it. Like, so it's knowing what your key strengths are and you know finding that out like with conversations with mentorship or just talking and looking at your resume and making sure that you know what are the top three things, look at the job, look at the organization, look at your experience, what are the top three things that you have to offer and I always tell people with entry level positions, I'm looking for your one thing, like what is your one thing that you're going to come and you're going to be able to do, you're gonna, you know, is that social media, is it graphic design, is it sales, I'll teach you all the other stuff, we'll work on it, we'll, we know there's going to be some growth there, but what's your one thing, what are you bringing me? And make sure that I know that, like that's on your resume, that you sell that, That's that goes a long way um, when I'm looking for those. The, the storytelling is, it, is absolutely key. Um, and you know, the, the resumes that we typically get for entry level positions, like yes, you know, you might have some experience, maybe an internship, but it's the, it's the folks who can relate kind of what they've done with their work experience um, and say, you know what, I haven't necessarily done this directly, but how, how can I tell a story of indirectly? I think, for example, folks who are, has anyone worked in a restaurant before? Okay, yeah. right, okay, perfect one, okay? It's um, being, a, or being, a, being a bartender, okay? It's like, yeah, how can you relate being maybe sort of working in a restaurant and a, and a, and a bar to maybe doing an entry level sales position. And it's about you know, working with people, being face to face, um, handling 
kind of complaints. Um, and it's the folks who do the best job of telling like, okay, when I was a bartender, or when I was working in this restaurant, this is what I had to do. And this is, you know, even though it's not directly exactly what we're going to be doing on a day to day, I've had this experience, and then we can teach you kind of the rest to kind of make it full circle. Um, so don't, like, there, there are so many jobs out there that you guys don't know that you're actually doing a lot of what we train and teach you on. Um, and we actually just nearly kind of put the dots together when you get here. And it's amazing by how many people go, oh yeah, I have been doing, some, you know, I have been doing this already at my previous job or, uh, or something like that. So that's the, that's the key, um, I, I think, to um, the folks who kind of separate themselves when they don't have that direct experience. And so often, you know, folks will come into a job interview and they'll say, oh, I did some other stuff, but you wouldn't care about that because yeah. it's not ticket related or it's not sports related. My last sales guy I hired had worked at Nordstrom selling shoes. And he came in and he said, look, I've worked at Nordstrom and they take care of customers and I will take care of customers here. And I might have to do some things to make happy, make our customers happy once in a while. It might affect our bottom line, but I'm going to keep every fan that comes in this ballpark. And I was like, sold the second yeah. he said it. But there are people that would come in and say, oh, I sold shoes at Nordstrom, but you wouldn't want to know about that. So just, yeah, tell your story. I think nonfiction storytelling is what I think. I, I think about it what we do, but it's also what candidates should be doing in an interview or two. No one can tell your story like you tell it. So no one else is going to do it like you. You know you know your past, your history. Now, if you spend, I've interviewed somebody at the first part of their career, and he spent like 10 minutes talking about how he blew out his rotator cuff in high school when he was going to do this great picture. Ten minutes later, my eyes are rolled back in my head. Like, okay, this is a story that should have like started and stopped in a moment. So, so, you, so yeah, you, you need to have some self awareness, but you should. You, stories are generally uh, linear, you know, kind of chronological, so you know, from early stage to later. You don't spend too much time back in your younger days, but you, there's something unique about you. Everybody has something unique, so don't uh, over overlook that or minimize that. So, come up with your story and start to practice it on other people. Do not tell your story for the first time in front of an interview. You know, you know do it with a reference, do it with a past, or do it with a friend, I don't care, you know, you know, a neighbor. But say, you know, can I spend my, here's my elevator pitch that's like two to three minutes long. Maybe there's a five minute version, maybe there's a two or three minute version. But you should be able to put something interesting and unique in there. And if you have a hard time thinking about storytelling, this is gonna sound funny, read children's books. I've got a little one at home, and I read these children's books, and I'm like, that is such a great story. It's like the, the, the people who write children's books and write movies these days, the storytelling is amazing. I'm not right brain, I'm left brain. So when I see that kind of stuff, I'm like, I can just kind of hack that, or I can use some of these things, you know, make it my own in whatever way, but it gives me some more creative juices. Because you're not creative, it doesn't mean you can't create some great story by yourself. So. I think a lot of us too, a lot of times when you're trying to promote yourself, you feel a little little odd doing that because you don't want to be sound like you're cocky or braggy. But it's an interview. You're promoting yourself. It's your one shot to stand out from the next interview. So, you know, mention your bartending experience. Mention you worked in a restaurant. Because in a restaurant, you get stuff thrown at you all the time. Literally, but not, not all the time. You know, you get drinks thrown back at you as a bartender. It's funny, but I was a bartender forever, and that was one of my first jobs. I thought it was going to be a job I did for a couple months, and I did it for about six years. But, um, you know, when it's everything you've done, there's a lot of things you've done that you might think are insignificant, but they can be a great part of your story. They're, 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 they're what made you who you are. And don't be afraid to kind of. Chest and I'm proud of it. You know, you helped it. your church run a certain fundraiser every year to raise money for some sort of cause out there. And you, each year the money, the revenue grew and grew. And talk about that. You know, we, we do want to hear about that. Like Stephanie said, there's a lot of things you think we don't want to hear about. I just was actually reading a book about Nordstrom's and how they knew they couldn't beat the pricing of every company around, but they said, we're going to have the best darn customer service you'll ever find. And that's Something actually, when I read it, I said, you know what, I'm going to make that be something we do at, our, at the office. I'm going to make sure our customer service goes up a notch. And because we can't be the cheapest, we can't be this, we can't be that, but we can, we can always make sure, like you said, that fan's going to come back. And so tell your, tell your story. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? Any more words of wisdom from the panel? Mid-afternoon saloon. <laughs> <laughs>
One, and it's kind of simple and sounds sounds simple, but it doesn't happen a lot, is say yes and volunteer for stuff if you're an entry level person. Um, especially, you know, I worked in minor league hockey, and I just said yes when they asked if someone would do something. I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Yeah, no problem. A mascot costume, sure. It was an awful experience. <laughs> Terrible. Wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Voluntarily doing it. But, but they needed someone to do it, so I stepped in and did it. And it actually separated me from the five other account executives. And they knew, oh, we can count on Joe. We can count on Joe to, to do things. And I grew in sales skills. But I wasn't, I'm not the best salesperson, I can tell you that. But I'll outwork people, and that's what I did. And it's simple. It's just, it's, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, just outwork everybody and volunteer. As JV said, it's a lifestyle. It's not a 40 hour week job. So I just outworked everybody else. That's why Billy Makers loves me, because I outworked everybody else. And it's simple. It's easy. You guys, oh yeah, of course, no problem. But actually doing it is another thing. Because that's what's going to separate you. Every, there's more and more sports management majors coming out every year. It's just a giant funnel that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And the sports jobs are just pretty static. So it's more and more competition. And the way you can stand out is by just volunteering and saying, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll, I'll do that. Especially in, when you're in the minor leagues, because it's you don't have a ton of people in your front office. So you need everybody pulling. Everyone pulling the rope, everyone working together. So if you're looking for an entry level job and you're doing that, just say yes. But yeah, sure, I'll volunteer to do that. Yep. Is it fun to go work a, a, a street fair? No, it's not fun, right? You'd rather be out with your friends, right? It's terrible standing there and trying to pop tickets. It's not the most fun. But if you continue to do those things, it sharpens your skills and you're just there for the team. You're volunteering. And that, for me, I think. That's one thing, seeing an entry-level person, seeing them do those types of things, it makes me go, that's someone we want to keep. And when the people don't do it, that's someone I don't want to keep. Someone recently had a chance to work, work a sales table at a game, or go to the game. They chose to go to the game. That person's not moving forward with us. It's dead serious. They chose to go to a game rather than working a sales table where we needed to sell season tickets. And so it's like, oh, you made the choice, that's fine, no problem. There's not a place for you moving forward. Because it's just not, you had a chance to sell for us in a very important game. You chose to go watch the game instead. So you're a fan, which is awesome. Have fun. We'll probably sell you season tickets later on down the line. But it's just, you're not, you're not what we need moving forward. We need everyone pulling together. Everybody. Because everyone else said, yes, I'll be there. I'll be there working the table. I'll be there. So. I think there's this mentality, I talk about it a lot, I and mean, everyone in this room likes sports, right? We all love sports. And um, I sit down from Canada and say, why do you want this job? And I go, I like sports. Okay, well, how much are you going to like sports at 2 a.m. when you're, you know, putting down group events or, you know, doing whatever? Like, it's got to be more than, than just that. The, the effort has got to be there. And there's, you're not going to, just because you like sports, you will not like every single thing that you have to do in your job. Because that's life. I mean, not everybody likes every single thing you do every moment. You'll hopefully love the organization, the people you work with, the mission, and everything else. But, but there will be things that you think, I don't really want to do that. But it does. It sets you apart. And that's... That's what I think we all look for, especially the smaller the front office. We want someone that can wear a lot of hats and can help out with a lot of things, and it's going to just flat out work, you know, other people. And so um, that is time and time again what sets people apart. It's not the master's degree. It's not always, you know, the experience or the this or that. It's just coming in, and it really is a grind, you know, just grinding it out. Um, I just can't stress that enough. I think that's really at the heart of it. I said this in the previous session this morning, so that, um, go work for people, not logos. Um, I, the only people that truly, I believe, that care about what logo you work for are people who don't work in the sports industry. Um, we, uh, you know, that is what gets you in, in finding, a, finding people who have your best interests and in, in growing you as a, as a professional and also personally, I think is the number one thing that you guys should be only worrying about when finding sort of that first job in sports. That is the only thing. Whether that I had my first job in Kansas City, I didn't even know where Kansas City was uh, when I first when I first moved, and then moved to New York, work in baseball. And I'm thinking, why is there a British guy working in baseball of all places? Okay, why? Because I wanted to go and go work for great people. Okay, and that's what got me to Colorado is kind of going work for great people. That is how you make your career um, is by is surrounding yourself with people who want to be the best version of themselves. Um, and I think if you can find an environment like that, you're going to have fun, 
you're going to become a better person, uh, and, and then ultimately you're going to be in a career and a job that you're ultimately going to want to enjoy. I think, yeah, and I was telling the story earlier, just finding just people and people that are growth and development. I, I started with the Bells um, six years ago in a sales job. I knew how to sell. I could still be in that sales job. So if I'm working for a manager that just wants me to produce and do numbers, I'm still in that sales job. But they were folks who cared about me, developing me, and I was on a one-year plan, and then I was on a two-year plan, and now we're six years removed. Our owner doesn't even sign checks anymore. It just comes to games, and he lets me run the show, and I have so many more career opportunities now, and my, you know, the, my whole expanse of what I can do is so much more than what I could just sell. That's because of the people I surround myself with, and, and finding those people and making sure it is about you and your growth and development. There's a lot of hard work along the way, but just people that are willing to teach you and be in your back pocket, be in your network as, as you go forward. I think who you hit your wagon to is really important in those first couple of years. Jill mentioned it earlier with the kind of people that were out there volunteering and raising their arm, uh, their hand for things. Um, I didn't make it up, but I like the saying, be a fountain, not a drain. Everybody in their lives know people that suck energy out of the room. And unless they're your family, you probably don't want to have them. Maybe you don't want to have them anyway. But you know, you have a choice to, to, you have a choice to hire these people. And once you've identified that those are the people, they're not going to stay in the organization because they're going to bring drama, they're going to bring negativity to a hard job where you're working your tail off. It's not nine to five. So if you, you can control your attitude, you can control, I mean, I'm not the most charismatic, optimistic person in the world, but I know that I can control my attitude and that's going to rub off on my staff and the people around me. So kind of check yourself at the door if you're in a bad morning, a bad day or whatever. You don't bring it into the office with you. If you don't bring it into an interview. So you make that choice and say, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to convey energy, I'm going to convey enthusiasm, I'm happy to be here. People will like to work with you, people, they, people hire people they like. You have to be confident, they'll hire you if they like you. And once you get in an organization, you know, you're not going to, no one's going to fire you because you were too nice. They might fire you because you're confident, but not because you're too nice. So if you bring that energy level to the office, um, you're, you're going to find new opportunities. You're not going to stay in your lane, because it's not in my job description. I've heard people like, well, I'm not going to do that, it's not my job description. What are you thinking? You know, you're, you have to expand yourself out and, and create a name for yourself in, in this organization. How do you do it? By doing really good work, by meeting with other people in the organization, by being a go-to person that people can come to and, and that you can uh, be, be viewed in, you know, internally in a really positive light. Excellent. One, one more yeah. thing is just for young people starting out, I see this now very often is Everyone's ready for the next step immediately. They get in and they think, I'm ready, I'm ready to, I'm ready, no, I'm ready to be promoted. When am I going to be a manager? When am I going to be a director? You're going to do that job really well that you got. Do that job really well. And I just read a quote from Davo Swinney. I hate Clemson, so I don't even, like, I hate Clemson. They're terrible. But he had a great quote recently about, I just read it, I read a story about him, which I don't know what that, that what tells going on. But he, he had a, a quote in there about when he became the, uh, interim head coach, and it was, if your job is to bring coffee and donuts, you go get the freshest donuts and you get to get the best coffee. Because if that's your job, do your job the best you can do. And that will lead to good things in the future. If you're too worried about the next step and becoming a manager and getting that title and all that, you're going to not do a good job in the job you have, and you're going to totally screw yourself. You've got to do that job really, really well. Because there's a lot of competition for that next level too. Because it's it's a, as I, we said up here, it's a small industry, so we all know people that are also looking for that job as well. So when you have that, when you get in that, when you get your foot in that door, kick it open and do your job, do the job as best as you can, because that's what's going to set you apart. Don't get worried about what the next step is. Or when am I going? When am I going to be a manager? I hear that. When, am, when you do this job really well, then we'll talk about it. But if you're if you're worried about that, you're taking your eyes off of today. So win today, every single day. That's the way you can move on. Yeah, I, I've noticed that too. I mean, when people get in and they do the job for like a month, and then all of a sudden they're like, well, what else can I do? Or can I do your job? Or, you know, and all yeah. of a sudden they're like just not even paying attention to what, you know, if we hired you to do something, it wasn't just because we liked you or we wanted you to come fill a chair in the office. Like, we need that work done. And you doing the best job you can do and keeping your head down, that's how you get noticed. And so often it doesn't work out when people just start looking around, well, what else can I do here? You know, it's like, hired you to do sales and a lot of times people they get in the sales chair but then they want to see well what else can I do what else can I do and keeping your head down that's how people succeed I mean I just had a sales guy who went through his first year making 150 cold calls a day and uh, he 
he's now through the first year of it, and now we can do some other stuff. And we can, you know, but that first year, you, you've got to have your eye on the prize, and I think that's what makes you successful. Great words of wisdom from our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.